This is hands down the best all-in-one liquid cooler that I have tested. It comes in at 40 pounds less than Corsair's 360ml uh, RGB well, cooler, and yet this runs insanely cool and insanely quiet. So let's take a look at it and you can see exactly why I like this thing so much. First, a look at what you get in the box. You of course get the cooler itself, which yes, those fans do come pre-installed in the box, which is fantastic to see. But of course you also get all of the mounting hardware you'll need to mount this to pretty much any modern Intel uh, desktop or even HEDT platform sockets and AMD's AM4 sockets. Unfortunately, there's no support for Ryzen Threadripper, uh, but if you want to mount it on Intel's now aging HEDT uh, like 2011 and 2066 sockets, that's apparently perfectly fine. You even get a ridiculously small tube of their new MX5 thermal paste, not too confused with the car of course, and as for the cooler itself, well, this is the 360mm version, which means that it has uh, space for three 120mm fans. The radiator is, of course, pretty massive thanks to that size, but more importantly, it's also thick with like eight Cs. This is 38 millimeters thick, which is up from the more standard, say, 28 millimeters you'd find on most of the sort of Corsair AIOs that are fairly common. The fans that come included are their P12 ARGB PWM fans, which are their pressure oriented, hence the P in P12, and 12 being 120 mil or 12 centimeters. These are actually pretty impressive. They have a, a rather unique design, uh, potentially thanks to their addressable RGBs that are in the center, but basically they have uh, a ring connecting the outside edge of all of the blades, which is relatively unusual since most PC fans have sort of uh, separated blades, if you like, with the outer edge uh, just running close to the, the edge of the, the fan shroud itself. But uh, in this case, it gives a rather nice aesthetic, especially with those addressable RGBs, has a rather nice look to it, and they seem to perform pretty well too. One of the absolute best things about this cooler as you get it out of the box is obviously the fact that those fans are pre-installed. It's great to see, but more importantly, they're actually already wired up and connected. In fact, even those pesky RGB headers, which are always falling apart, they've actually put heat shrink tubing around those connectors to lock them together and keep them in place. On top of that, the wiring is not only connected all up, nicely daisy chained, but they've also then routed that wiring through one of the uh, sort of sleevings that go around one of the tubes down into the pump. And then those wires are joined up with the wires that control the VRM fan and the pump inside, and then they only output two wires. That's all you need to connect, a single four pin PWM fan header and a single addressable RGB header, and that's it. This is so much better than Corsair solution, which is to give you two individual wires per fan and another two wires from the pump block unit and then another SATA power connector to hook up to the, the controller unit and a USB cable to hook up to that controller unit and to your motherboard. And it's just, it's, it's horrendously messy, whereas this is so clean elegant and simple. The pump block unit is a, a rather unusual shape. I guess to me it kind of almost looks like a, a cricket or something that's crawled onto your CPU with some uh, hoses coming out its back. A bit weird, but uh, the main thing that's weird about this design is actually that little fan up at the top. It's a 40 millimeter uh, fan that is designed to blow air over your VRMs. Now, you might be thinking, well, that tiny little fan is just going to be a screeching mess, right? Well, happily, the answer is no. It is incredibly 
silence. In fact, the system is on right now, but uh, you can hear the road that's outside my house more than you can hear this thing. In fact, honestly, I can barely hear this thing and I'm sat right next to it without a side panel on. The main purpose of that VRM fan is to solve the problem that most AIOs create. If you have a look at, uh, say, Intel stock cooler, while that thing's running, it's blowing, well, now relatively warm air out in every direction, which blows that air onto your VRMs and VRM heatsinks to help keep them cool. Even with a standard air tower, because of the proximity of that air flowing through the, the heatsink, it's drawing that air around and over your VRM heatsinks. But with an AIO, you almost never have any even remotely close airflow over your VRMs. And so this means that it's actively drawing in relatively cold air from the center and exhausting it outwards over your VRM and even over your RAM to some degree. Now I mentioned the noise of that tiny VRM fan, but I should talk about the unit as a whole. This thing is remarkably quiet. Especially at idle, you can barely hear any of it, if at all. In fact, even with the side panel off, I'm struggling to hear anything from this, which is great. But even under load, it's still remarkably quiet and certainly more quiet than most other CPU coolers that I test. If you then, say, do a pretty substantial overclock, well then you do hear a slight increase in noise, but it's still nowhere near as loud as pretty much any other cooler that I've tested, which is remarkable considering both that this has, well, three fans that in theory should be making more noise, and actually a fourth tiny little one, but with how much cooling potential this thing has, again, that's pretty remarkable. And speaking of the cooling potential, I'm testing with a Ryzen 5900X, which at stock uh, runs about 142 watts of total socket power that needs to be cooled. Most AIOs have a reasonable time with this, although generally speaking sit somewhere in the 70 to 80, 85 degree range, depending on the test. But this one, running the Gooseberry render, uh, in Blender, which is a relatively long and certainly intensive workload. This sat at the high 60s to low 70s and was effectively silent in comparison to the front case fans that uh, you might have noticed are not currently spinning because uh, these are incredibly loud by comparison to this thing. They're not generally all that loud, but just in comparison, they are noticeable versus this, which is almost silent. Even in Citibench R23, running its repeated uh, test mode for 30 minutes doing the all-core render, it still only sat around about 70 degrees Celsius throughout the duration of the test, and again was remarkably quiet while doing so. Most other 240mm AIOs that I would normally use, that would sit more like 80 to 85 degrees Celsius and with a much higher duty cycle on those fans. I should note that I'm using the Ryzen 3000-5000 optimized uh, mounting position, which is essentially uh, moving the cold plate to be slightly off of the CPU. That sounds counterintuitive, and it does mean that there is a small section at the top of the CPU that doesn't have any heatsink on top of it, but it actually helps drop the temperatures. That's because the layout of a Ryzen 3000 or 5000 series CPU has the majority of the heat production in the two or even one core or core dies or chiplets, uh, which are situated uh, while in a motherboard towards the bottom side. And uh, with this cooler, uh, basically the, either the, the micro fins that are on the backside of the cold plates or the fluid pattern uh, means that it has more efficient cooling towards the center of the cold plates rather than more toward the edges. And so with this slightly lowered positioning, you do actually get slightly better temperatures if you're using a Ryzen 3000 or 5000 series CPU. Now, I mentioned the stock performance results, but to see if this thing would even break a sweat, 
I also had it run with Precision Boost Overdrive enabled with the PPC or Package Power Target set to 185 watts with the uh, EDC 125 amps and the TDC 170 amps. And the results, well, they probably won't surprise you. Um, the, the cooler really didn't have to try all that much harder. The CPU did increase its temperature by yeah, about 4 degrees Celsius. Considering you're going from 142 watts to 185, that should be a pretty significant difference and uh, a normal 240ml cooler would struggle or would definitely be increasing that GC cycle. But with this, in that uh, blender gooseberry scene, it went from a peak of around 72 to a peak of around 76, and it, throughout most of the render it was actually a touch lower than that. And again in the Cinebench R20 run, well, it sat around 72 degrees Celsius instead of about 68, uh, and again it pretty much just sat there with a relatively low GT cycle on the fans. It did increase them slightly, and so there was a, a touch more noise, but Again, it's incredibly manageable, and for pretty much any CPU, potentially barring the 11900K, I think this CPU cooler is going to be plenty fine. So clearly this is an amazing cooler, but there has to be a catch, right? And yeah, there is. Uh, specifically, it is the mounting method. Now, I should make it clear that if you're a normal user who installs their CPU cooler once and then probably doesn't touch it for a number of years, this really doesn't matter all that much. It's frustrating when you start to get it on and actually a quick look through the uh, Amazon reviews, uh, the sole reason why a lot of people have listed this as a one-star product is just because of the mounting method. But with that said, if you do switch out your motherboard or CPU with some frequency, this will definitely get on your nerves. To give you some context, most normal CPU coolers these days, especially for mounting on an AMD Ryzen chip, they essentially either use the, the standard backplate and brackets and just use some clips that hook over them. This isn't my preferred method as it's messy and not really all that effective in the grand scheme of things, but the more premium coolers will just let you remove the brackets that are on the uh, motherboard that come by default and screw in some standoffs and then just place the cooler on top, obviously with some thermal paste in the middle, and use some thumb screws to hold it all down. This is why I like the Fractal Design S24 so much, because it's such a simple uh, installation method. Arctic though, well they decided to be just a little bit different. The way that you mount this cooler on an AM4 socket is you screw on two arms to the pump block unit, which is fine. You use just one screw in the center of each, and uh, then was where it gets complicated. You'll need to remove the stock brackets, and then you'll need to install not just a standard bracket, but you'll need to sandwich a small plastic spacer, which actually doesn't fit, you know, snugly over the bracket in the back. It, it will just fall off or knock over very easily. Uh, but you need to sandwich that between this incredibly wide spacer bar. This bar also has two different holes in it for that Ryzen offset mounting position, uh, but then when you fish in an incredibly small but long screw through that uh, bracket and through the spacer, you can then screw that into the back plate and then repeat for the other side because trust me, the spacer, if you try to put one on, will have fallen off or been knocked over in that time. So put that one back on and then use a screwdriver to tighten them both down and then repeat that for the bottom bracket. Except here's the thing, 
Those brackets are slightly different sizes and slightly different positions, and you have to put them on in the right orientation with the slightly, almost imperceptibly smaller one up at the top and not down at the bottom, otherwise you put it on the wrong way around and you have to swap it all back around again. Then once you have both of those brackets on, you'll have to pray to tech Jesus that the brackets don't make contact with your VRMs or the capacitors next to them, uh, to your RAM modules, or to interfere with your uh, M.2 slots or the heat sinks that sit on top of them. These brackets are incredibly white, to the point where I would be genuinely concerned running them on a great number of motherboards. Uh, and then when you finally get all of that on, you then get to use four incredibly small thumb screws to tighten the whole thing down onto the little studs that are on the brackets that you've just installed and then that's it ready and you can you know plug in your two cables and get on with it. If you can't tell this is a rather infuriating process that really doesn't need to be this complicated. Arctic please can you fix this? Uh, just offer uh, or set or uh, include uh, different bars to attach to the pump unit that fit the standard spacers and include the same standoffs you already do for the Intel sockets, and that's it. It keeps it nice and simple, it makes the installation process much easier, and you won't have people having to block off their M.2 slots or short the VRMs by installing your cooler. So what's the verdict then? Well, despite the rather interesting mounting method and the lack of any manual in the box, you only have a QR code that you have to scan, except they actually include two different QR codes, which does actually say for, you know, technical support and things, except this QR code uh, takes you to a page that just returns an error 404, except it doesn't just return an error 404 because it actually uh, gives you a cookie pop-up notice and no matter what you accept there, it will then instantly refresh the page in an endless cycle until you close the page and manually search for their support site instead. Despite these quirks and features, I cannot get over just how incredibly performant, uh, effectively convenient and quiet this thing is, and how insanely low priced it is. Like, I wasn't kidding, this thing is £40 less than Corsair's 360mm RGB option, and it's actually even £5 less than their 280mm uh, you know, RGB option as well, and if you don't fancy the RGB LEDs that are actually only on the fans, then you can save yourself a further £15 and buy the non-RGB version, which is the same thing, just with slightly different fans, and pay £95 instead of £110. But either way, you still get an incredibly performant, quiet, and impressive cooler that can cool any chip that at least it fits on, and all of that for a relatively low budget. I should also note that if you're planning on installing this on a Ryzen system, you can make it slightly easier for yourself by only removing one of the stock brackets at a time, which will keep that bracket or the back plates attached to the motherboard and so it won't fall away as you try and install the pesky, well, plastic spacers and wide brackets. Uh, but all of that is, again, easily dismissed thanks to the, its performance, and so this gets an easy and solid recommendation from me. If you're interested in picking one up yourself or checking out pricing when and where you watch this, I'm going to leave a link to it in the description down below. That's an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can check it out and maybe pick one up yourself. Also, you've heard my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the Liquid Freezer 360? Is this a cooler you'd pick up yourself? Or would you go with something else, maybe one of the smaller versions, which I have already reviewed up in the cards above? Uh, and would you go for the ARGB one, the standard RGB one, or the just plain black, no lighting one? Feel free to let me know that in the comments as well. If you'd like to see more videos like this one on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday basis, you can do that by hitting the subscribe button and turning on the bell notification icon. 
You can also support the channel in a whole load of ways, including uh, checking out the links in the description for uh, supporting directly through Patreon, or you can do it directly on YouTube as well through the YouTube join button where you get access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and some cool emojis to use in the comments and on our weekly live streams. You can also check out merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself, or there are other affiliate links if you want to support less directly, things like Overclock GK if you're buying from there, or a load of other things like VPN options, Hubble Bundle, Stream Streamlabs OBS, and a whole load of other stuff, so do feel free to check it out. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. I'll leave the 240 review on the end cards if you want to check that one out. And yeah, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in the next video.